All right, last part for this lecture. I want to cover a couple non-ideal issues and then look at some applications for lenses as well. And so you have to be aware of non-ideal effects. And so the easiest way to make a lens is to use grinding and polishing equipment that gives it a perfectly spherical radius of curvature. But if you have that perfectly spherical lens, what you find is near the edges, the light does not converge all to the same focal point. And so a perfectly spherical lens does not work as we theoretically predicted. And I said I'll ask you why later, but I'll, I'll go ahead and actually ask you why now. And if you think about it, one of the assumptions we used when we had the lens formula is that we assumed the lens was very, very thin when we drive the lens maker's equation. Well, a real lens is not infinitely thin, right? And because of that, the light has to spend some time here in the lens before it gets to the other refracting surface. So it refracts here, spends some time in the lens, which changes its position here. And that basically gives you this spherical aber aberration where not all the light focuses down to the focal point. You know, a typical spherical lens is good enough for most applications, but if you really need a highly performant, high performance lens, then you need to go to things that are called aspherical lenses, which are more expensive to make, but they don't have this problem. Now, one thing you can do is, let's say in the lab you have a plano convex lens and you want to basically get the best performance you can out of it, let the minimum amount of spherical aberration. Well, the best, tra the best practice is to have the convex side facing the beam source. And so if I had a laser beam coming in and I had a plano convex lens like this, I would have the convex side right here facing the laser and then it would focus down better than it would if you reversed it, okay? And if you're looking for more area, more details, you can go here. Also, up at this point, we've assumed all the light comes in parallel to the surface, right? Well, if you come off, off angle like this, you also get an effect called coma, where you can see that it doesn't all focus down to a single point at the focal, focal plane as well. And so not all applications need this, but sometimes you have to be careful, and again, you'll need a slightly modified lens if you're coming in off axis like this. Some other non-ideal effects, let's say I have, I have not a single wavelength of light like a red laser, but I have white light coming in all parallel and I shine it through, or multiple color light coming through here parallel and I shine it through a lens, you see that the focal points change for different colors of light. This is called chromatic aberration. And you can see it when you're doing imaging or photography uh, quite frequently. If you take a high quality lens with little chromatic aberration or a high quality camera, you have an image like this. If it's a poor quality camera with a lot of chromatic aberration, chroma meaning color, meaning different colors here, different wavelengths, you'll notice that the edges here, you get this frayed effect. If you zoom in, you can see a little bit of color bleeding out of the edges. And that's because of this chromatic uh, aberration, okay? And so what causes this? Well, you should be able to answer this at this point because we've covered it previously. Remember, the index of refraction of a material changes with wavelength of light. That's called optical dispersion, right? And so because of optical dispersion, the focal length of light will change with different wavelengths of light because if the refractive index is changing, then you put a different refractive index in the lens maker equation, you get a different focal length, right? So would this be better or worse for high magnification or zoom applications? Well, it gets worse the more you zoom in, okay, the shorter the focal length, because you have stronger refracted angles, and then the dispersion starts to become more and more significant. So how do you fix it? Well, one way you fix it is you, made a, you make a compound lens where one element could be made of a, gla of a glass such as F2, which is a type of glass with high dispersion, while the other type of element in here could maybe be made of a material that has a low dispersion, and they have opposite radiuses of curvature, okay? And so what happens is the dispersions then start to cancel out a little bit. And so this is a compound lens where they've got different dispersions for, the, for, the, for this material outside versus the internal material. And if you do all the ray tracing, you'll find the dispersions can almost cancel out to the point where you get a common focal point. Now, the disadvantage is one, this is more expensive to make this type of lens. And secondly, this lens in the middle reduces the focusing power of the single lens here. And so the end, in the end, your focal point's a little bit larger and your magnification's a little bit weaker. 
so you don't get quite the the focusing performance, but your chromatic performance is increased. And if you look at a nice camera system, they'll have lenses like this in it. And you know, for example, look at a microscope where you're like, why, why does a microscope have all these lenses here? It's the exact same re reason. You're trying to focus down on a really small object and get a ton of magnification. If the object's looking at, if you're looking at it in color, then you need all these different lenses to help cancel out dispersion to give you a nice high quality image without the colors bleeding out. So how, how small can you see with a lens if you're using it for an imaging type system? Well that's going to come back to this same relationship of divergence. So if I want to see a small object it's going to be also related to basically you know how far, sm small I can focus the light down. So I can do the system if I have a small object I could be looking at the light coming off that or I could treat it as focusing light down to a small point. They're both this, the same thing effectively. Okay? And so if I want to see the smallest possible object, you want to design a lens with a high numerical aperture, NA. Numerical aperture is NA. And what numerical aperture is, it is the refractive index out here, N, times the sign of the half cone angle here for the light gathering space between the lens and what you're trying to see here, which is given as alpha here, okay? So, if you want to calculate alpha, well, you just got a triangle here, right? So if this is my diameter of the lens D, okay, I've got D over 2 for this side, and then I've got F for this side of the triangle, and I can then calculate alpha using this relationship. And if alpha is a small number, again, I can assume that the tangent of the angle becomes the angle, okay? And so this term of numerical aperture is the focusing power, which is also the largest possible value for alpha. So if I had greater focusing power, then the lens would be focusing in like this, and look at my alpha, it gets larger, right? And if you look at this, I'm getting the lens closer and closer to what I want to look at kind of makes sense. When you move your eye closer to something, you can see it in higher resolution, right? So if I can move the lens closer to something and get it in focus, I get a larger alpha here, you can see, which gives me a higher numerical aperture. So numerical aperture is, is thought of as two things. It's thought as the focusing power, which is the largest possible alpha here, but it's also thought of as the light gathering power, okay, which is also the largest possible theta. Again, the light gathering power, is, is you can see it here, if I have a, this is low numerical aperture, medium numerical aperture, and high numerical aperture uh, microscope lenses, low numerical aperture, I can only gather light in this small cone to go into this system. As I go to higher numerical apertures, you can see that I can catch light coming off at much greater angles and get closer. And so my light gathering power, even out to wide angles, is increased. But what about this effect of refractive index out here? So I said that numerical aperture is refractive index outside the lens times the sine of this, of the, uh, the, the half cone angle here, alpha. Well, if I raise my refractive index out here, then my numerical aperture increases. Does that, let's see if that makes sense. Well, if we go back to this equation we had previously, you'll see that if I raise both N2 and N1, so this would be the N1 in that equation would be out here, N2 would be the lens, make them both bigger, then R has to affect, you know, it's the same as having effectively a, a higher radius there for that lens, okay? And if this is constant, that means my distances have to decrease. So if these go up, okay, well, I mean, actually, that's not a good explanation there, but basically, the if you raise these refractive indices, then you can basically get a smaller distance from the lens and get a larger alpha and get higher magnification. So another application of, of our numerical aperture is important. That's when you're looking at CBD ver CD versus DVD versus Blu-ray discs. And if you look at these technologies, you can get to higher storage densities on the surface that you optically image as you do two things here. And so if you look at CD, start with a longer wavelength, go shorter and shorter, so you're decreasing the wavelength. 
which allows you to image smaller features. But also for these systems, they're decreasing the numerical aperture of the lenses, which again, as we said, allows you to get closer, as you can see, to the surface and see smaller and smaller features on the surface, going from less than a gigabyte to 23 gigabytes for Blu-ray, for example. Now, there's some really advanced imaging techniques you can do with lenses as well. One of them is called confocal microscopy, which is used in medical imaging all the time. What they do here is they basically have a, a green light source that hits this special mirror, which is called a dichroic mirror, meaning that two-color mirror, and what it does is it reflects green light but transmits red light, so it's different for the two colors. And so the green light's reflected down through this lens onto what I want to image. So in this case, it could be something like this, um, um, this is a bacteria here, okay? So I've, it's fluorescent and I'm imaging it and I'm trying to view the bacteria. And what this system does then is then the, the, the light that is fluorescing comes back through here. And there's a couple things that happen here. What you do is basically you put a pinhole up here. So if I have a pinhole, this is only for a certain point of light coming off the sample would focus through that at the focal point of the lens, right? And so I basically only pick up light which will be at the right distance from this lens such that it focuses through this pinhole and all the other light from other positions is rejected. And so you can get these beautiful images that are cross sections of cells. You don't have to cut it in half. Literally, you can focus and see just what you want at a cross section of the cell, as you can see the outer cell wall and, and things inside of it as well. And so that's a more advanced way to basically use an M, a lens and its focal point to reject out of focus, um, out of focus uh, light and then just put what's fo in focus into the photo detector so you can only see that portion of the image. Some really advanced lenses are, have been coming out recently. One of them is uh, referred to as an electrowetting lens, and I'm not going to go into, into a ton of detail, but they put in there a high refractive index oil, a low refractive index fluid, which is mainly water. They put voltages, and they can change the radius of curvature real time. So now you have lenses that you can tune um, electrically. In the lab, we actually have an electrowetting lens you can experiment with towards the uh, end of the, the end of the. Um, the course if you want as one of your projects. We also have a mechanically tunable lens that uses pressure and a deformal membrane to change the radius of curvature for a lens as well. So that's it. At this point you're finished with the, this, this the lecture on lenses. Make sure you can answer these questions. This one might be a question of interest for you and there's a great tutorial website here as well.